Hi, it's Tobias here with another episode of Marble Science. In my previous video I tried to illustrate how important social distancing is in the initial phase of a virus crisis with a little toy model. And now obviously we don't want to keep up these measures forever. So in this video I will explore different scenarios when to and how to uh, relax such measures. Essentially there are three scenarios which have been also described in a recent publication by the Helmholtz Society. And we can define these scenarios in terms of the reproduction number R. So this R which tells you how many people get infected by one infected um, person. So if we relax the measures and R climbs above one then also the number of infectious people will rise again. If we manage to keep R at 1, then the number of infectious people will stay constant. And if we manage to um, br bring R below 1 or keep it below 1, then the number of infectious people will decline. I think we don't have to talk much about the first scenario because with an exponentially growing number of infectious people, hospitals will be overwhelmed sooner or later. But this is not the case for both the other scenarios. So let's take a deeper look at these two scenarios and let's see in my toy model what the advantages and disadvantages of these scenarios are. Like in the previous video, the model consists of these little marbles living in such houses and working in such factories. And that's essentially all they do, going to work and back to their houses. So it's a very, very simple model. The only way how a virus can spread in this model society is that each infectious marble has a 3% chance to infect any of the other marbles on the same floor of a building at work and also at home. The government, if you like, in this model has one measure to fight the virus. Each day it can order a fraction of randomly selected marbles to stay at home. And this leads to fewer contacts between the marbles and consequently also to fewer chances for the virus to spread. In this way the government is indirectly able to influence the reproduction number R of the virus which is not explicitly defined in this model, but instead emerges from the number of contacts between the marbles. Later I will also introduce testing and tracing to the model. And maybe I can already give away that this also has very important implications for the different scenarios. Also like in the previous video, marbles which are healthy and still susceptible to the virus are always shown in yellow in the simulation. Once they get infected, marbles will um, turn red and then I assume that they won't experience any um, symptoms until six days after the infection when they uh, will stay at home and no longer go to work and then finally 14 days after the infection I assume that then the marbles recover from the disease and I assume that all of them become immune which is shown with the blue color. So enough of the introduction, let's look at the simulation results. Here's the first of the simulations. So let me first tell you what you can see in the graphs on the top. The leftmost graph shows you which fraction of marbles is in the susceptible, infectious or recovered state. You can see that in this initial phase of the simulation, the number of infectious marbles is growing exponentially. The graph in the middle shows the fraction of marbles that are ordered to stay at home. In the beginning, no marbles are ordered to stay at home and everyone goes to work. Finally, the graph on the right shows the accumulated number of missed workdays per marble, which is used here as a very crude indicator of what the impacts on the economy might be. 14 days into the simulation, the government in the simulation now orders marbles to stay at home. But the fraction of marbles that need to stay at home is not constant in this simulation. Instead, I implemented a feedback loop with the number of infections occurring each day. So whenever fewer marbles get infected, the stay at home percentage is reduced to give the marbles as much freedom back as possible. And whenever more marbles get infected, 
more marbles are also ordered to stay at home to contain the virus. We can see that with this stay at home order and the feedback loop, the exponential growth of the number of infectious marbles is stopped and it is possible to keep this number of infectious marbles on a constant level now. However, to keep the virus under control, also the fraction of marbles ordered to stay at home needs to stay on a constantly high level. So we continue to accumulate missed work days, as you can see uh, in the graph on the right. More and more blue marbles are now also appearing in the simulation. So marbles which have recovered from the virus. And this is good and bad news at the same time, because it means that more marbles had to go through the disease, but it also means that more and more marbles are immune against the virus here in this model. On the long run we can see that the fraction of marbles that need to stay at home in order to keep the virus under control is going down. And this is because more and more marbles are anyway immune against the virus. So I guess that this is the hope of supporters of the strategy. That you can relax the measures once the immunity is growing in the population. And conceptually this idea is not wrong, but it's important to consider the time scale here. In this simulation it takes months until enough marbles are immune, but this is when we keep around 10% of the marbles in the infectious state. In the current COVID-19 pandemic, the fraction of infectious people is instead estimated to be much lower. So let's see what changes if we instead only keep 1% of the marbles in the infectious state. To simulate such a low fraction of infectious marbles, I had to scale up the model because 1% of, in this case, around 2000 marbles is so few that you get a strong influence of coincidences. So I scaled up the model to 1 million marbles, which is great for reproducibility, but I'm afraid I can't show you the model animations anymore because it's just too big. But we can still observe what happens if we look at the graphs. So again, 14 days into the simulation, the government starts to react and orders marbles to stay at home. But in contrast to the previous model, the fraction of infected marbles is not at 10% yet. Instead, the stay at home fraction is constantly readjusted to keep the fraction of infectious marbles at 1% here. We can see that it takes considerably more time to build up immunity in the population. 200 days into the simulation, we can see that it was possible to slightly reduce the stay at home fraction due to the growing immunity. But that is really only a minor effect and even a year after the outbreak, we are nowhere near herd immunity. I think that this is a very important take home message here. It is possible to build up immunity with the scenario where we keep R at one, however, Depending on which fraction of the population is infectious, this happens on a time scale of years rather than months. So let's look at the third scenario where we keep R below 1 and see how this plays out in the model. The solid lines in each of these graphs show the data that you've just seen before, which represents a government which is maybe a bit impatient and relaxes measures as soon as and as much as possible but still without letting R rise beyond 1. In comparison, the dashed lines now show the data representing a government that keeps up the initial stay-at-home order fraction for a longer time before changing to the same behavior as the other government of reducing the stay-at-home fraction as much as possible but still without letting R rise beyond 1. We can see that from then on, both governments have to keep up roughly the same stay-at-home fraction. But in the dashed case, there are considerably fewer infectious marbles and from the number of recovered marbles, we can see that distinctly fewer marbles had to go through the disease. If we look at the accumulated number of missed work days in the graph on the right, we can see that in case of the dashed scenario, more work days were missed 
in the initial phase, but from then on both curves evolve largely parallel to each other. Only after more than 200 days we can see that the curves are actually slightly diverging because the government in the scenario represented by the solid lines is now able to slightly reduce the fraction of marbles that need to stay at home due to the growing immunity in the population. What I learned from this simulation is that measures like staying at home and social distancing in general are measures where the effectiveness is independent from the number of infectious cases. We can see this in this phase of the simulation where the same fraction of marbles need to stay at home in both cases, although there are distinctly fewer infectious marbles in the one case. I think that this is quite logical because if you reduce the number of contacts of all people, then you also reduce the number of contacts of all infectious people. And it doesn't really matter if there are 10 or a million cases, the number of contacts of each infectious person is always reduced in the same way. And this means that if we invest something in the beginning and bring down the number of cases, we can keep this lower level with the same effort that would be required to prevent the numbers from growing in a case with more infectious people. Sadly, it also means that with fewer cases, measures like social distancing are not becoming more effective. But, and I think now comes the most important part of this video, not all measures are like that. Not all measures are equally effective independent from the number of cases. Consider testing and tracing, for example. It's clearly more effective if we can trace and test the contacts of each suspected case than if we can only do the same for, let's say, 1 in 10 people due to a limited capacity. So in my last two simulations, I included testing and tracing to the model. So when marbles start to experience symptoms, which in the model is six days after the infection, they will seek to get tested. And once positively tested, all marbles living in the same flat will be put in quarantine. And also all contacts will be traced and tested. In the model, these are all the colleagues working on the same floor. However, I limited the number of tests to 500 per day in the model with 1 million marbles. So marbles with symptoms that could not be tested will still stay at home, but their flatmates won't change their behavior. And also possible cases among the colleagues at work might not be detected. Apart from the testing, both model governments behave exactly like they did before. The solid line government again reduces the stay at home fraction as soon as and as much as possible without letting the reproduction number R climb above 1. And instead the dashed line government keeps the stay at home fraction on a high level to bring down the number of infectious marbles to 0.1% and then also relaxes this measure as much as possible without letting R rise above 1. I know that this is a lot of graphs here, but Please bear with me, you are already familiar with the three graphs in the upper row. The two graphs on the bottom now additionally show information about the tests. The left graph shows the number of tests that would be required to test all marbles with symptoms and all traced contacts. The bottom right graph shows the number of actually performed tests. Keep in mind that I limited the testing capacity to 500 tests per day. We can see that initially with the number of infectious cases also the number of required tests is growing drastically. However, in the dashed line case with a falling number of infectious cases also the number of required tests is falling. In this part of the simulation 500 tests are performed each day in both cases but this is nowhere near the number of tests required in the solid line case. You can see that at this point it is possible in the dashed line case to reduce the fraction of marbles that need to stay at home to a lower value compared to the solid line case because a larger fraction of the required tests can actually be performed which makes the testing and tracing more effective. 
At some point when they caught up with the testing and they can perform more tests than they need to, it's even possible in the model to take back the stay at home order completely. And at the same time, in the solid line case, the fraction of marbles that need to stay at home has to stay on a constantly high level. They constantly would need orders of magnitude more tests than they have and the great potential of testing and tracing is essentially evaporating into thin air. A potential which is very effectively used in the dashed line case. If we take a look at the fraction of marbles that had to go through the disease and the accumulated missed work days, we can see that here it's really not a question whether we want to save lives or the economy. If we have to decide between these two scenarios, it's rather the question whether we want to save lives and the economy or whether we are going to unnecessarily harm both. The only downside is that it is necessary to invest more in the initial phase to bring down the number of cases. But then we can continue to profit from this lower number of infectious cases until hopefully a vaccine is available. The final take home message here is that there are measures like testing and tracing where the efficiency to bring down the reproduction number is highly dependent on the number of cases. And we might make it unnecessarily hard for all of us if we don't use these measures effectively. So preventing the reproduction number from climbing above one is one thing, but it's also very important to bring down the number of cases. Thank you very much for watching this video. Of course I know that there are much more elaborate models by scientists all over the world, but I like to think that also such a simple model has its place. So it's obviously not possible to make predictions on a quantitative scale with such a model, but it helped me to make, uh, to get an understanding on a more qualitative level about what the consequences of decisions and certain measures are. So if you feel like this video also added to your understanding, please help me to spread this knowledge. And in any case, I'm looking forward to read your questions and suggestions in the comments below. Thank you.